Hi guys, it's Mary McIntyre here. You may have seen a recent video that I did for the UK Meteor Network channel where I talked you through how I approach photographing meteor showers and you may remember at the end of that video I said that even if you didn't catch any meteors there are still some things that you can do with the data that you shot that night and that gave me an idea for a video because I spent probably four or five days solidly processing the images I took on the night of the peak of the Persids I did catch some meteors, I got some bright ones, but as well as that, I managed to create an ionization trail video. I did a Milky Way time lapse, I did some stacked Milky Way photography, I did two different lots of star trails and star trails time lapse, and just straight night sky time lapse videos. So there was so much that I was able to do just with those same shots. And this is something that you can do as well. If ever you've taken a set of data where your camera is pointing the same way and doing the same exposures, with some free software and some pretty simple steps, you'll be able to do this as well. So I hope you find this useful and hopefully you can go and revisit some of your old data and do new things with it that you hadn't thought of. If you do enjoy this video, please hit the like button because that will really help this video get spread out by the algorithm to other people that may find it useful and if you like this sort of video please think about subscribing to my channel as well. Enjoy the video and I'll see you later. So my first camera that I had running on the peak of the Persids was actually pointing north because I usually um, get some really nice bright fireballs over towards the plough. So I had it pointing north and the first thing I did was to take the majority of those pictures. Uh, I went all the way through till dawn. Uh, so here were 1039 pictures, so quite a lot because there were just 15 second shots. I deliberately didn't include the first view because I was messing around with the tripod and the camera got nudged a few times. So any time from where the pictures, when I scrolled through them, the camera was kept still, I decided to include in the time lapse. So I've just, without any processing whatsoever, just dragged the raw images into PIP, which is free to download. Um, I'll make sure there's a download link in the description box. In the input, just keep everything as per default. Processing options, one thing that I like to do here is resize the frames. This isn't the same as cropping that you can do above. This basically makes the, the individual digital SLR frames a bit smaller because if you keep them at full resolution, the video is gonna be huge. My laptop can't even play the videos half the time. Um, so for most purposes, if all I'm doing is putting it online is I resize them to two, uh, 750 pixels and that works fine. Obviously, if you're gonna do this for something high res then don't do this step but basically I don't have enough disk space or compute power to actually keep these full size. When you go to the quality options um, it shouldn't have anything ticked but make sure that the enable quality estimation isn't checked because you don't want it to do that you want to play them in forward order. Um, that box playing forward order is usually default ticked. I like to just add um, a pause at the end of each clip because I quite often put different clips together and I like the fact it just pauses for a little while. I, my go-to is 15 frames per second on this as you'll see in a second so I usually pause that for 30. I go on the upper side because you can always trim this down again in Movie Maker if the pause is too long but if it isn't long enough you can't really put it back so I tend to whatever the frame rate is I just double that for the pause at the end. Output options, AVI should be automatically ticked. And if you can hear, you can choose what frame rate you want. I always go for 15 and then I adjust the speed of that video in Movie Maker. But if you know that obviously this is a lot of images and for most purposes, that's gonna be quite a long video. So you can make that faster if you want to. But generally when I'm doing this, the videos are much shorter. And if you do it at 60 frames per second, which is what the default is, then the video is over within about four seconds. So I always go for 15, that's just my go-to, you don't have to do that. And then you click start processing and then I'm not going to do it because I've already done this and I've got the AVI that I can show you in a second. So that will process all the videos and then it will send it out as an AVI that you can then do stuff with and edit in Movie Maker just to add titles or just basically make it play a bit faster or a bit slower depending on how the video looks. So that's what I did with the, the basic images from the first camera.
My second camera was actually pointing south. So the southern portion of the Milky Way was then moving across the field of view of this camera. I did have some um, issues with the lens fogging up because my hand warmers had cooled down and then the battery died. So I didn't include everything in this particular set, but because it had the Milky Way in it, I wanted to make sure I processed everything in Lightroom first. So before processing, this is what the frames looked like. And I just made a few adjustments in clarity and in some of the, the highlights things. So if I can just show you on the one that's processed, I brought the clarity up a little bit increase the highlights and the whites and just brighten the sky a little bit and also on the the highlights and lights down in this little module here and I added a bit of noise reduction as well because these changes always make the Milky Way look quite noisy. The beauty of doing it in Lightroom is that you can go from this to this and then if you just copy the settings of that you can then edit select all and then if you right click and develop settings and paste, it will paste that to everything in the data set. So here that would have taken approximately eight seconds to do the same adjustment to 726 photos. Now I didn't go as far as I normally would when processing the Milky Way because I normally do some specific adjustment brush stuff along the, the length of the Milky Way. But because it was moving between frames, I didn't want to have to do that manually for 726 photos. So this was a bit of a, you know, a, a kind of sitting in the middle ground. I wanted to do some processing, but not the extent of processing that I would normally do. Once you've done that, you can then just um, go up. They're all selected because we just selected them all. Just file export and then it will export them all and you can put them into a subfolder. So your processed pictures are in a separate place. Once I'd exported all of these pictures, I then did the same thing again by just dragging them into PIP, setting the, the pixel size to about between 750 and 1200 pixels. I can't remember exactly what I did this time. And then once I'd done that at 15 frames per second, AVI, and with a pause for 30 frames at the end and then just exported that. And once I'd got that AVI, I could then play with that in Movie Maker as well. So very similar process. I just wanted to add that slight processing step to bring out some of the structure of the Milky Way in this field of view. So here we are in Sequator. There are 36 light frames from that entire data set. I've found through experimentation that stacking too many Milky Way shots in, in Sequator will give you like a weird star trailing effect around the edges. Uh, so I tested this expecting it not to work, but it was actually okay. And I've just let it choose its own version of the base image. That's fine. There are 20 dark frames in there to help with noise as well. The thing that I've done here is to say align stars and we want accumulation. We're going to align on the stars and we want to freeze the ground because the Milky Way moves quite a lot within 36 times 15 seconds. So that means that the house and the tree will become blurred. So what you then need to do in the sky region area, um, just basically have an irregular mask and it will give you this thing and you just colour in all of the bit that you want it to stack. Um, so you can start off with a huge circle and then shrink that down to, to kind of get in the nooks and crannies. And so what that will do is then align and stack the images using just the bit that you've selected, but keep the foreground still. And then it will blend that back in with your foreground shot. So it basically saves you having to do this um, using a layer mask in Photoshop. So it's a really good piece of software and this is free of charge and it does actually a very, very good job. So once you've done that, I just left everything else as um, kind of default, really. You have to tell it in this button where you want to save it. So if you double click here, and just tell it where you want to, to save your pictures. And then you click start and it will stack the pictures and save it in that output folder. 
And then I'll show you what it looked like after the stack and how I processed it in a second in Lightroom. So once I'd stacked the Milky Way photos in Sequator, uh, I actually did two parallel stacks to see which one came out best. And this was the one that I actually preferred. And I did some processing using the adjustment brush as well as a, a few other things. And off the back of the stack, it doesn't actually look like the, the Milky Way looks that much better than the single shots. But actually, once you process them, this is what I ended up with. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot more data kind of hidden within that, trying to counteract some of the light pollution to the lower ed area there. So I always use Lightroom for Milky Way processing, and I usually use the adjustment brush here, where I just have the brush set really big, much bigger than that, probably about that big, and just kind of work my way along and select the, the knots of the Milky Way and do the processing that way. I can do a more in-depth video separately on that, that subject but this is basically in summary what the mil stacked Milky Way ended up looking like. This first stack that I did was okay but I just think I preferred this one. The, the light pollution doesn't look as bad in the second one but I always do multiple stacks and see what comes out best because you just never know what's going to work. So that was 34, that one, the first one here is 23 images stacked this one was 35 images stacked. So having those extra few frames actually made the difference. And given there were only 15 second shots, I think this came out quite well, especially because the Southern part of the sky is our worst in terms of light pollution. So um, especially considering I wasn't trying to photograph the Milky Way here, this is just making the most of the data that was used for something else. So I was quite pleased with how that one turned out. So the other thing I did with both cameras was to create some really nice star trails pictures. So the, the data that I included here was the stuff that didn't have too much cloud in it. Obviously, if you're going to create star trails, the camera has to have been kept very still. So if there's been a point where the camera has been nudged slightly, then you need to stop the data set there. So this particular one was with the north facing camera and this is 649 images here, all 15 second exposures. Now, normally if I'm doing star trails, I would do 30 second exposures, but you'll see that 15 seconds works absolutely fine. I've got 35 darks here. So I've made sure that I'm excluding dark frames. All I did there was put the lens cap on keep everything else the same, take 35 shots that have got the lens cap on taken in the dark, just to get a readout of the hot and cold pixels and the dark signal noise from the camera. So that will give you a smoother Star Trails result. You don't have to do that, but with the age of my camera, the number of hot pixels I have, that's definitely a step I need to include. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna do here which is going to give us one of the other time lapses that I was able to produce from this data is to save the cumulative files. So what that will do is each time it adds the next 15 second frame, it will save the file and then the third frame will be added and it will save a file. So you'll then have a set of data where as you scroll through it, the star trails get longer and longer and longer. And that will allow you to then take that data and put it into PIP, doing exactly the same as I've shown you for all the other stuff today. And that basically using a 15 frames per second will give you a really nice star trail set. So I did this with both cameras. So all you do once you've selected all of this and told it where to save the, the cumulative files, highly recommend setting up a new folder for that, by the way, because you don't want to mix up your raw data and your cumulative data. Then you just click stack and it does it all for you. It's fantastic. And once you've got a stacked image, you just hit the save button. The cumulative files will already be saved, but you can then save the, the final star trails um, as its own file name. So simple to use. This piece of software is fantastic and it works on Mac, Linux and Windows. So it's just so amazing. Can't recommend this program highly enough. So that's how I do the star trails. So I'll show you the stacked images and the time lapses that I got from both of those cameras now.
So one of the bright meteors that I picked up um, in the plough that took place at 23 44 UT was bright enough to leave an ionization cloud. Actually, a couple of them that I imaged that night were bright enough to leave a bit of one, but because of thin cloud, it was only visible in one frame afterwards. Whereas in this case, the ionization trail was visible in 27 photographs, actually 25. I included a couple at the beginning as well. So the idea here was to crop it and then apply the crop and the process that I did to this picture to the rest of the day data set the way that I showed you earlier and that would give me a set of frames that I could then use to create a time lapse in PIP showing that ionization. So obviously I, this picture is nice as it is because you've got some context with having the plough and some foreground but that's not so easy to see and the ionization cloud. So once I'd processed it it was cropped quite aggressively but then moving from frame to frame you can actually see this kind of puff of ionization cloud starting to slowly dissipate so obviously this is quite heavily processed it's heavily cropped which given the sensor on my camera the age of it and the model of camera that I've got I was really pleased to have picked that up at all so it's a really nice me meteor there's obviously a bit of green color there because it's a persid and so yeah very simple just process this one applied that to all the other pictures in the set exported those and then imported them into pip 15 frames per second the same that I did with all the other pip frames and then at the end of it I had a time lapse which I'll show you now.